another round of applause. Please. Pastor Lamar, I have to tell you, um, I was raised Catholic. I, let me just put that in context. I was raised Catholic, so um, I never felt like running around the church before. You know, I mean, people run around the church. But I was thinking as they were singing, you know, I could take these heels off, <laughs> hitch just a long skirt up, and just take me a jog around the church. That was inspired, and I am grateful. Thank you so very much. And good morning, church family. Good morning, and thank you, Roby, for the opportunity to speak at the celebration of Lay uh, Sunday. Pastor Lamar, as you know, I appreciate you so much. I'm grateful to worship under the leadership of an Afrocentric woke brother who uh, causes more trouble than I do if the whole truth is to be told. Reverend Moya and all the other uh, reverends, thank you for your church leadership. I really do appreciate it. I especially appreciate the fact that I don't think I've been a member for eight months yet. And um, y'all make me look forward to Sundays. Um, I decided that I was going to join when the week before I was singing Welcome to Metropolitan and I wasn't even a member. I was like, okay, I think I implicitly joined the church. So again, I'm just very grateful uh, to be here. The theme of the K of Kelly Lay organization today is moving to a higher level of service. The theme reminds us that while we have special, spiritual leaders, our pastors and our religious team, we as lay people also bear some responsibility in our own spiritual growth. You see, it ain't on them, it's on us to serve God and to serve our fellow human beings. We can't simply follow pastoral leadership without asking ourselves what kind of leadership we're offering. Not only to ourselves, because the greatest people always talk about um, discipline, well, and leadership. The first person you can lead is you. If you can't lead you, you can't lead anybody else. You people take all these leadership classes, but you know, if you don't know how to lead you, forget it. So the question has to be, what kind of leadership are we offering each other? How are we calling each other? And the question all too often is also a question of faith. Our scripture for this morning speaks to our faith. It speaks to the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And I want to thank the young lady, um, Alexandria, who did such a beautiful job in reading. That's a beautiful job. One of the things that the scripture says is forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead. I press onward the goal to win the price for which God has called me heavenwards to Christ Jesus. Well, now, in this Black History Month, we do need to move ahead, but we cannot forget that which is behind. We must be like the Sankofa bird, associated with the proverb, si wo we we fi na wo Sankofa a yinke. That's twi. And it means it's not wrong to go back after for that which you've forgotten or simply go back and get it. What is it that we need to go back and get? I suggest that we need to go back and examine our faith, our temerity, our resilience, qualities that seem to be in short supply up in here right now. Qualities that we often forget in this very venal world. Qualities that we forget in the era of looking for clicks and Instagramming, personal popularity, as opposed to integrity. We would ask ourselves as a member of this congregation, but also as African-American people and our allies in this house, the house of Richard and Sarah Bass Allen. And please, y'all, Richard Allen gets lifted up. Sarah Bass Allen was his partner. Absent that partner, there would be no church. You know, we must, and that's one of the reasons I love Reverend Lamar so much, because he is not a sexist. See, so there's some preachers who are sexist. They preach the Bible, but, but see, people have hijacked the Bible. Just up and snatched it. I call it cherry picking the Bible. You know when somebody got just one verse? Just one verse, and they keep running that verse by you, and you're supposed to say amen, and I'm saying, fool, what was on the next page? You know, not just amen like that. So the question that I would ask you, the parable of the two builders, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Two builders, one built a house on rock, and another on what I would call shifting sand. The one who built on rock was steady and solid. Rains fell, floods came, all kind of stuff happened. 
The winds blew and beat on the house. It didn't fall because it was on rock. Rock is solid. The other house was built by a foolish fool. Did somebody say a foolish fool up there back there? A foolish fool who built his house on shifting sand. He was lazy. He was trifling. He didn't know how to do foundation. So the rain fell, the floods came, all kind of mess happened, and that was the end of his house. My question to you, brothers and sisters, is, is your faith built on rock or is it built on shifting sand? Is your belief in our ancestors, and that what they gave for us, built on rock or shifting sand? Because if we have as much as we have and do as little as we do, when you saw black folks who had nothing and did everything, how did we get HBCUs? Folks were frying chicken. Folks was making pound cakes. You know, I remember um, when I first went to college, I, you know, I, I look a little bougie, um, and both of my parents have doctorates, but the fact is that my parents were divorced when I was six. So we have a lot of money. And mom told me up front, if you go to school, you won't get a scholarship. Because my daddy was trifling. He was good people, but he was trifling. You know, for the record. And he was a sexist, and he had four daughters. So, you know, he kept telling me, go, go try to get yourself married. I'm like, dude, please. I said, you was married. No. Uh, just saying. But in any, any case, when I went to college, I, and I didn't get to go to an HBCU, I was admitted to Howard, but there was a little backstory. I was admitted to Howard, but I didn't graduate from high school. You see what had happened was. Uh, I just kind of was a pain, and so they sent me away from San Francisco to Mississippi to go to school for a year. That was not fun. And, I, and Mom said, you can't come back here unless you know how to act. I said, well, maybe I could go to college. So, you know, Howard said, you come on, but send us your high school diploma. Didn't have one. So what was I to do? Go to Boston College where they didn't care because they were just looking for black people. I mean, they sent a bus to the hood and got a bunch of black folks. Half of them didn't graduate. I mean, literally, there was a drug deal in my class. There was a sister who was a former lady of the night who was turning tricks out the dorm. But they sent a bus to Dudley Station. Anybody who knows Boston, they said, come on, y'all. So everybody didn't graduate. But since they were letting folks in from the hood, hey, I wasn't that bad of a risk. <laughs> and you know, in the neighborhood, folks were like, you know, she's a pain, but she's smart. So I remember old black folks giving me, and you know how old black people do you? They gotta just hand you a bill. They go both fold it up like 42 times, then they go put it in your hand, then they cover your hand up, and then they go pat your hand. Then you got to walk around like this till you get home to see what it was, because you want to be rude and look right there. But you know, we believe in education as a people. That's what we do. We believe in our faith and we believe in each other. But we have to really ask ourselves, do we really do that? Do we really believe? I mean, we have the rhetoric of that, but really, do we believe that we should serve the hungry, the homeless, the people who are economically marginalized? Do we, we believe, and everybody up in here looks a little bougie because it's a little bougie church. It's all good. It's all good. But given that, we have been the beneficiaries of the evil practice of predatory capitalism. Let me, we have been the beneficiaries of predatory capitalism. And that's okay, nobody wants to go hungry or har harmless, homeless, and I ain't gonna give up my pho, so just for the record, just saying. But the point is that we still must, if we're looking at a higher level of service, be critics of a system that is broken. We can't simply sit and simmer in a broken system and say it's okay. We can't come in here and worship and then walk outside and see a homeless person and walk on by. And I love us for what we do with our groceries that we give once a month. What happens on the other days when folks, excuse my Ebonics, ain't got no groceries? You know, the food banks tell me all the time, we turn people away on Thanksgiving. Everybody wants to serve food on Thanksgiving. They go home and eat up their big old meal. But what about April 11th? Just a random day. So just saying, just saying. So the question that I'd like you to ask, if there's a takeaway, is a question, is my service at its highest and at its best? You know, I love Black History Month for any number of reasons. I used to say back in the day, if you give us a week, we'll take a month. And if you give us a month, we're going to rock your world because we're going to take all year. See, Black History Month began January 1, and it ends December 31st. 
because every day is black history, and there's black history up in everything that happens in this putrid nation that we live in. Yes, I said putrid, let's be clear. That man lives in a house, and Reverend Lamar, I bet myself that I'm not gonna try to curse up in here, which means I won't use the name of the person who calls himself the President of the United States. That's the worst curse I could do. Other than that, by the cursing, I'm not, we know we already discussed that. And we prayed on that cursing, but that other, we just go call him that man. So, you know, we built that. We built that. So everything in this country is about us. We wouldn't have a South were it not for us. We need to own that. And we need to lift it up all the time, every time. Now, let me say Black History Month. If we never think there's patriarchy in our community, in our world, consider this month, we're so much more likely to lift up our brothers and our sisters. If you look at that stamp, and I went there this last night about 2 o'clock in the morning. I got up in the middle of the night. I have problems. I'm insomniac, so that's, it's, it had nothing to do. I, but I woke up, I said, I wonder how many women have been on these Black History Month stamps. And I started counting and I fell back to sleep. I knew I had to count some to fall back to sleep. But the fact is that the preponderance of those stamps are men. That's just how it is. But there are women who need to be known. But even more than that, we need to recognize the history of the people whose names will never be known. Because history belongs to he or she who holds the pen. And nobody told the story of the domestic worker. Nobody told us. A few people have told the story of the railroad porters. A few. But we don't know all the names. We don't know the names of the brothers who went down into the coal mines. Only union who have black and white folks working together. So these are the stories that we need to tell. These nameless stories. And we need to be very sensitive to the fact that so many people's lives and history it's swallow. Pastor, I'm so happy that you mentioned Maggie Lena Walker because she's a sister that I want to talk about today. Uh, I lift her up in the spirit of the Sankofa bird because hers is an energy and a legacy we need to go back to and claim. I lift her up in the name of economic development and self-determination because this is an area where we've often underachieved. I lift her up because she was a woman of faith. I had the opportunity to go to Richmond a couple times this summer to um, go to the Magdalena Walker house and to look at some of her journals. And she always writes about God. She was a woman of serious faith. She was a daughter of an enslaved woman and reportedly an Irishman. She was born in Richmond in 1867. There's a statue to her in downtown Richmond, which I'm excited about for Brazilian reasons, but also because, Elsie, you know, it just adds one more statue to the less than 20 statues that black, less than 20 statues in this whole United States for black women. Less than 20. Are we that invisible? You know, give me a break. Um, okay, don't get me started. Okay, so she became involved in the St. Luke's Missionary Society. It was a benevolent organization that was based in Baltimore. She rose to become its president in 1899. Of course, when the sister came in, they were running out of money, but that's all right. She turned it around real quickly. She founded the St. Luke's Penny Savings Bank. But in 1901, before she founded the bank, she challenged the order. She said, we must have a bank. She started a newspaper and the bank. She said, first, we need a savings bank. Let us put our money together. Let us use our money. Let us lend our money out at usury among ourselves and reap the benefit ourselves. Let us have a bank that will take our nickels and turn them into dollars. That was Maggie Lena Walker. Why did she found this bank? Some banks would not take black people's money. You couldn't even deposit money. So many black people put their money in um, white folks who had um, safes. Now, you know, this is a losing proposition. Well, Massa got your money. Well, think about it. And you got to say, Massa, can I get my money back? Oh, what money? So that's why she started that bank. And at one point in our history, folks, we had over 100 black-owned banks. Now we have 23. Part of it, part of it is racism, changing regulations. But part of it is poor management on our part. And part of the changing regulations were designed to get at us. Magdalena had a colleague. His name was John Mitchell. He's an interesting brother, rather flamboyant. Uh, and you know, white folks don't like that. So he lost his bank because, again, there, I have this time in Richmond. People were writing that he was an arrogant Negro who had an automobile. So the fact that he had an automobile disqualified him from being a banker. He, like Maggie Lena, also had a bank and a newspaper. Our people were so much more entrepreneurial then. Maggie Lena was so brilliant that she foresaw 
the merch, she, she foresaw the depression. She knew that she didn't know it was coming, but she felt like we got all these little small black banks, and if anything happens, we're going to be wiped out of business. So they consolidated three banks. So Consolidated Bank and Trust in Richmond was founded in 1931. Um, and it was, I looked at all the bank records. It's interesting. Our people, our egos, we got to work on that. But the bank lasted for over 100 years, 1903 to 2005, the longest tenured black-owned bank. This woman, I mean, again, just amazing. And her faith was built on a rock. Every time she had an obstacle, she talked about her faith in God. Every time she had a rock school. Little known fact, but one of my favorites, she started a department store in 1907. Why? Because first of all, black women could not try on clothes. So we, we just took, had to take whatever. Secondly, there were very few jobs for us other than maids work or teaching. And very few of us were able to be teachers. So she believed that she was generating employment for our people. Amazing. Now the store only lasted, however, and this is a story of economic envy and, never mind, the economic envy. Last from 1907 to 1914, because crazy white people decided this black woman could not have a store. So they started something called the Richmond Retailers Association. Then they went to New York and to some of her suppliers and said, if you sell to her, we won't buy from you. So her stock began to dwindle. Now I cannot prove this, but I'm guessing, Pastor, that the other thing that happened is that crazy white people, actually I was supposed to call them melanin deficient today, but I guess I didn't have the vocabulary switch. Y'all will forgive me. Y'all know I know how to act sometimes. But I got, I got a little carried away with this stuff because I love this woman so much. But anyway, I suspect that they pressured their employees not to shop with her because we have other examples of that in terms of commerce in other cities. In any case, and dig this, when, the, when she first opened, there was so much excitement, 1907, $35,000 worth of receipts. By 1914, and these were 1907 dollars, by 1914, only $11,000 worth of receipts, and the order of St. Luke's was somewhat subsidizing. So you know, some pressure was involved. So when we look at, so we need a Maggie Lena Walker stamp, y'all. That's a stamp we need. We need that sister to be enshrined in a stamp. But in any case, economic envy has driven quite a lot of stuff. Footnote, a lot of people will tell you that lynchings happen because black men like white women over much. No, lynchings happen because of economic envy, plain and simple, because we had too much. Tulsa, Oklahoma, we had too much. Memphis, Ida B. Wells, documenting. Similar retail store to Maggie Lena. Brother, the only, the department store, not department, grocery store that we went to was a nasty store where white men were drinking and spitting and doing whatever they did because they just didn't have home training. And this brother said, you, I'm going to start me a store. So he started the store across the street, and of course, black people went there, and they didn't have spitting and all that stuff. But the white man got mad because he lost business. So the next thing you know, he actually tore out a peace bond against a brother over two little boys having a fight over marbles. And the next thing you know, these brothers were lynched. They were arrested and then they were lynched. They had nothing to do with any white women and any reckless eyeballing, just you black people have too much money. So we need to bear some of that in mind. But Maggie Lena's life reminds us, and I'm gonna try not to talk too long, Pastor, uh, reminds us that we have more than $1.3 trillion in the black community. But just one out of 10 of our dollars stays with us. $1.3 trillion let get HBCUs are scrambling, are the brink for want of money. Now, I'm grateful to all who helped support Bennett, but eight, the 8.4 million that we raised just gets us out of the hole this year. You know, we have, our endowment is $12 million. Sachs, the accrediting agency, says it needs to be about 50. We're not the only one. All the small schools who have less than, any school that has less than 800 students enrolled and less than $50 million, will be in trouble at some point. So we need to, as a people, say it's important to support our HBCUs. I mean, what we have us begging for what we, you know, need and like just enjoying what we want, what does that say about us? What does it say about our faith, our resilience, and our tenacity? 
It's called, I'm believing in the house that's on shifting sand and not the house that's on the rock. Predatory capital is not fair. It's designed to suck the life out of us, bombarding us with consumption opportunities, enslaving us in high interest debt. The Fed says that 40% of all Americans, look at your row, four people on your row, could not finance a $400 emergency without going into debt. That's like your transmission breaks, or, you know, I don't know. That's deep. But here's what we must know. Even with the shackles that we have on us because of predatory capitalism, with what we have, $1.3 trillion, we could do more for others and more for our community. We have yet to attain the mastery that Maggie Lena Walker envisioned. Do we have her values, her sagacity, her faith? Are we committed to moving to a higher level of service? Are we content to be where we are right here, right now? We have all of the language of grandeur. You know, we have the resplendent black is beautiful clothes, you know, with the Afrocentric language. We greet each other as king and queen. But if we think that black is beautiful, why don't we buy black? I mean, if we really think that black is beautiful. If we think we have, should have self-determination, why aren't we more connected to the community? But see, part of the thing is this. If you swim in muddy water, you're going to get dirty. If you are a socialist that swims in capitalist water, or you say you're a socialist, we don't know what that is in America. But if you say you swim in capitalist water, you're bound to swallow some of that. If you're an African-American in a racist, patriarchal, heterocentrist, capitalist society, some of that stuff is going to rub off on you. So you might say all the same kind of things that, OK, here it is in my notes. See, I knew I had it. Melanin deficient people say. Just for the record, it was written down. You might even have statistics to back up some of the stuff that you say that the white folks say. Like I remember in 1992, and Reverend Jackson is my brother and my friend, but I remember when he said he got scared. Remember that, Elsie, when he said over there in Shaw, he got scared when he saw black children walking behind him. I'm like, Rev, really? I don't get scared. At first I talked to him, then I holler at him. And the one time these little brothers tried to bug me one time right up on 13th Street. It was hilarious. They walking behind me talking mess. We could get old girl. We could get old girl. I turned around, I did like this, ah! They read. <laughs> I acted like I had lost my whole mind. <laughs> they said, she crazy. I'm like, uh-huh. And you're not going to get old girl either. <laughs> but, you know, we have this whole thing. We say some of the more negative stuff about our people. HBCUs, I'm going to go there. When I went to, to lead Bennett College, it was one of the proudest moments of my life. But one of my best friends said to me, why would you waste your talent on an HBCU? That's because I want to, and it's not a waste. Now, footnote, when Gurley's daughter got kicked out of the University of Connecticut, Malvo, can you get my daughter into your school? I said, I said you want to waste your daughter's talent on my HBCU? Have us send the application in. Like, you know, I didn't forget. But we say some of the things. And if you look at the data, and I don't know if Ivory Tolson is here or not, that brother is sharper than sharp. And he's got this book called No BS, which stands for bad statistics. And he breaks it down. See, he don't curse, so he wouldn't say no BS, the other one. Uh, but in any case, he has shown how effective HBCUs are. How absolutely effective. We overproduce in engineering and science. Morgan State, more black women PhDs in engineering than any place else in the country, you know? So we need to tell that story. No, it's like, you know, we start mumbling and, you know, well, I don't want my child to go to HBC. Why not? Do you hate yourself? Do you know? I mean, the only reason you wouldn't want your child to go to an HBC is if you really do hate yourself. Think about it. I mean, it should at least not be off the table. It doesn't have to be on the table. It should be off the table. You know, and that, that's just something we have to deal with. But, you know, we're saddled with what I call the Du Boisian double, double consciousness. Oscillating between what we know to be true about ourselves and what other people have told us about ourselves. And we go back and forth and back and forth. You know, knowing that we are kings and queens, but also mirraged by alien images. Du Bois says, one always feels his two-ness. An American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring souls in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. If you believe that black is beautiful, you better believe in us. If your dual consciousness does not allow you to believe, then check yourself. And it's easy enough to check yourself and ask somebody else to check you. 
We can't progress if our faith in ourselves is on shifting sand. It must be a rock. You must be committed to black people. Now let me say this about 10 times, black, 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 black. Cause see, some of y'all don't like to say black. Y'all are people of color, you know. No, black people, y'all, African descendants. Black is not a cuss word. So black, 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 black. Now, we can have alliances with other folks and we should, and we must. But don't run away from who you are hiding under people of color. What color? Black, 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 black. Thank y'all. See, Mar Maggie Lena was ferocious in her belief in black people, and especially in black women. And she was never timid about calling our brothers out. In fact, I'm going to take a minute. I know I'm running out of time, but I got to tell them about Benaya's valor. You know I got to tell them about that. But Maggie Lena offered a speech in March 1st, 1906. It's called Benaya's Valor for Men Only. And she was asking black men to speak in defense of black women. This is what had happened. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But OK, I'm going to read part of it, though. She says, a few weeks ago when in New York, a white man, Tom Dixon. Now, Tom Dixon was the man who wrote the book, The Klansman which is the book that Birth of a Nation was based on. Tom Dixon calling himself a minister. See, this is how they hijacked the Bible. Any hateful white person with an agenda can start thumping on that Bible and saying that God said, God ain't say all that. But calling himself a minister stood up one Sunday afternoon in the pulpit of a white Baptist church surrounded by the best known colored ministers in New York City and uttered the most grievous slander against every colored woman in this country that human lips have ever spoken before. This man calling himself a servant of God standing in God's holy sanctuary on God's holy day said, you never hear of a white man committing assault upon Negro women. Assault means resistance. No Negro woman knows what virtue is. This is what Tom Zixon said. Then Maggie Lena said, if a colored man anywhere on land, on water, in the air, has said to an assemblage of white men, made such a statement concerning white women, that man would have died with that awful slander still warm on his lips. My dear friend, she asked the men of St. Luke's, are we less to you than the white women are to white men? Let me say two words, Kamala Harris. Stop it, y'all. I don't know whether she should be the president or not, but I do know this. Stop attacking that sister behind BS. And I don't mean bad statistics this time either. You know, yes, yeah, she light-skinned Me too, you know? We, you know, don't she not the descendant of slaves, but Jamaicans were slaves. You know, she's Jamaican and Indian, so come on, y'all. I mean, she put hot sauce on her greens. So what? Me too. I mean, let's talk about her policy positions. You might not like the fact she, how she was as a prosecutor. Guess what prosecutors do, for the record? They prosecute. You can't be elected to be a prosecutor and don't prosecute. It just ain't gonna turn out right. So I mentioned that because I have seen the vitriol from brothers. Yes, yeah, she married to a white man. Well, uh, some of y'all didn't step up. She went to Howard. Y'all missed out. I mean, she went to Howard. Come on, y'all. Some, some, some brothers. There was an A5A somewhere, she's, she's an AKA, A5 somewhere who just didn't stand up, you know, didn't step. What can you say? All right, I went there. But when you hear my sisters disrespected brothers, you're supposed to jump in there. You're not supposed to have some back say, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, that could have happened. We need you to stand there for us. And that's what Maggie Lena Walker stood for. So you know, the spirit of Maggie Lena Walker is an amazing spirit. And what she reminds me is of our economic power, but also of our faith, and not a faith that's on shifting. She never wavered from her faith in black people. If you believe that black is beautiful, act like it. Support black people and stop dissing black people. If your place is planted on a rock, act like it and walk your faith. And that means take your faith to this city hall, these council hearings, as these people are trying to decimate our city, stand there and bear witness to the evil. That's what has to happen. If you faith is planted on a rock, you know, then you know that there's some things, Pastor is doing something with the uh, interfaith network. We gotta work with that. We have gotta find allies to make sure that there can be a black presence. Yes, black, 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 black in this city. It's critical.
You know, on the block that I live on, I used to have to look for the white people. Now I got to look for the black people. Seriously, I mean, it's flipped over in, just, in a very short period of time. And the white people are crazy, too. They got dogs. They got bikes. They don't know how to act. That's another story, footnote. But in any case, if your place is planted on a rock, you will do your work. But if your faith is planted on shifting sand, you will look the part until you fall apart. The foundation of black people is a foundation of audacity and of temerity, of people who did not give up, people who no matter what happened, kept on putting one foot in front of the other, a dollar, a penny at a time. That's what our legacy is about. So consider the boldness of Richard and Sarah, and Sarah Bass Allen, of Maggie Lena Walker, of Dorothy Height, of the runaway slave who loved freedom more than safety. How much do you love freedom? Where is your boldness? Where is our boldness? Will you stand up and fight for justice in the name of God, in the name of service? Will you do what God has us to do when our lay organization says increasing the level of faith, of service? Thank you and amen.